the presentation today, and I think I will finish on time if I'm brisk. All right. The statement here in the green box has been received opinion in evolutionary theory for many decades. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this. The origin of life and its subsequent evolution are two fundamentally different scientific questions. And this goes back, in fact, to Darwin. He said, uh, in the origin, third edition, it's no valid objection to my theory to say that I don't address the origin of life. Who can explain the essence of gravity? Okay, so he takes the origin of life and brackets it and sets it aside as a scientific problem and says, you can take on my case for common descent of life on Earth by a natural process independently of, of the question of how did life itself get up and running. Now, prima facie, that's a reasonable position uh, to hold, right? You say, well, you know, origin of life and its subsequent evolution arguably are distinct questions. The problem is that's the prima facie perception. When you go more deeply and think about it more carefully, it doesn't follow. The, 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 the statement above does not follow, or this, sorry, I'm a little getting my order here mixed up. The statement below in the yellow box does not follow from this one. So this can be true, and yet this is not. So you'll often hear or read, therefore the origin of life has little or nothing to do with how we infer evolution or the branching structure of the tree of life. That's not true, right? So what's in the green box there, that can be the case, and I think there's a reasonably strong argument that can be made for that. Yet the claim in the yellow box doesn't follow from that. In fact, these theories, or what we believe about these questions, namely the origin of life and the structure of the tree of life, they interfinger. They're as closely connected as any two ideas can be in science. And in the next 20 minutes, I want to demonstrate that to you uh, via uh, what I'm calling Sober's Paradox. Okay, so let's begin with a common inferential puzzle that uh, a comparative biologist, that's someone who's working in genetics or molecular biology, who's looking at more than one model system. So he's not working with just E. coli or just yeast or just C. elegans or just frogs. He's looking broadly, comparatively at a variety of different systems and trying to suss out their relationships. And he's got a gene from species A and a gene from species B, and he sequences them and he aligns them, all right? And let's say those, of course, these are just cartoons. Real genes are very much longer. Those sequences exhibit 95% identity from base pair to base pair as they are aligned. Okay, that kind of similarity calls for explanation. You can't just shrug it off and say it's coincidental, right? That's the kind of matching pattern that we want a causal account of, all right? So we have a, you know, a puzzle here that we need to address. How do we explain this similarity? These two genes from two separate species are nearly identical along their reading frame. Well, we have two options. Either they share ancestry, on the right here is the shared ancestry geometry, or they arose independently. Now, most biologists, when you present them with something like this, they, they say, this is just hopelessly improbable. Of course they share ancestry. So here's a way of uh, representing this, causal scenarios. Most biologists will say, the evidence for this history is much stronger than the evidence for this history. If you have that degree of similarity between two sequences, it's, <coughs> it's more parsimonious to infer a common ancestor, let's call it sequence X, than that that similarity arose multiple times independently via, via unrelated causal pathways. So this is kind of a core principle, you could call it, of molecular inference, molecular phylogenetic inference. 
taking data from different groups, comparing it, and then trying to come up with the most plausible history to explain the origin of that, of those sequences of that data. Now we have uh, some probabilities here that we need to give names to. So let's call these the origination probabilities. And these are the transition probabilities. All right. Just so we can give names to the parts of, of this diagram. Now, as I said, the separate ancestry scenario appears much too improbable. So Gabriel Dover, who is dead now, but he was an evolutionary biologist in the UK uh, in uh, uh, throughout the last part of the 20th century. In a paper in 1987 addressing this, he said, look, Really, when you see this kind of similarity, you have to infer a common origin because otherwise you're going to be asking uh, to go against probability. Uh, there will be, you know, many recurrent independent origins requires freak conditions to drive these two sequences to the same composition. He says you would have to believe against the odds. <coughs> so you're going against what probability tells you. In other words, molecular convergence just doesn't happen. It can't. And he's, again, not alone in that opinion. Colin Patterson, who uh, died, I think, in 1998, uh, uh, evolutionary biologist at the British Museum, he said, look, convergence between molecular sequences is too improbable to occur. Just a similarity between two, two sequences isn't too improbable to be explained except by common ancestry. If two structures are complex enough and similar in detail, probability dictates that they must be homologous, namely share a common ancestor rather than convergent. And again, this is a core principle of molecular phylogenetics that we can count on molecular similarity above a certain threshold, not to mislead us. The signal it provides will always or almost always indicate genuine homology, namely common ancestry. And uh, this ap appears to make good probabilistic sense, okay? So uh, here are the first, what is that? One, two, three, four. Uh, the first nine words of the Declaration of Independence, okay? Written by Thomas Jefferson. If this string, this English string of words showed up in an essay, that a student of yours uh, claimed to have written independently of knowing anything about the Declaration or Jefferson and so forth, you would say, look, the probability that you independently converged on that English phrase, not even a complete sentence, just, just nine words, but the probability that you independently arrived at that, independently that is of Jefferson or the Declaration is very low, uh, there's probably some plagiarism that's happened here, all right? And as that string gets longer and you add more words and the similarity is maintained, the probability just plunges that it could have been an independent occurrence. This is how we catch plagiarists, right? She's in the Louvre <coughs> in a small, rather dark gallery that I was very disappointed to visit a few years ago. It's hard to get close to see her because there are so many people jammed into that gallery in the Louvre. But if you see her in London and you see her in Madrid, you can be sure those are copies of the original in Paris because the arrangement of pigment on board uh, to give this particular uh, appearance is very low that that could have happened another time independently. An unknown English Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa, right, somewhere in Manchester, and it happened to end up in a gallery in London. You say, no, it's crazy. These are copies of the original. And again, that's a good, you can trust that probabilistic intuition. So we do this, right? This is much more plausible <coughs> when we compare these scenarios. Now, Think carefully. Notice what probabilities we need to make this comparative inference work. In other words, to eliminate independent origins as the plausible scenario. Uh, so mini thought experiment here. Here is a quartz crystal. 
It has a, a, a well-defined chemical formula, SiO2, this oxide of silicate, forms crystals with a hexagonal prism geometry. Okay, you can grow these. I can give you the recipe for quartz. And if you have a pressure cooker uh, and uh, you get the, get the ions in the right ratio and solution, you can do this. Watch manufacturers do the Timex, or I don't know if Timex still exists anyway. They do this, right? Because quartz, you can put a current through quartz and it, it oscillates at a very high frequency, quite regular, which you can step down and run a digital watch using quartz. Quartz occurs everywhere on Earth, whenever and wherever the antecedent conditions are present. It's not a miracle. You're going to get quartz if the antecedent conditions are there. So keep that fact in mind. Now we put quartz here in our scenario as an object to be explained. This is going to lose every time. We are not going to infer an ur quartz. Why? Because these origination probabilities, given the right antecedent conditions, are effectively one. If I give you the recipe for quartz and you follow it, you can be sure that you will have quartz crystals in that pressure cooker after a certain period of time. They are bound to happen. The physics and the chemistry are deterministic. You're going to grow that hexagonal prism geometry. So the, the, the point to take away from this mini thought experiment is it's not the matching that leads us to infer common ancestry. It's rather the value that we assign to these origination probabilities. So here, let's imagine that object X, whatever it is, is balancing right on the point of this triangle here. That's why I've used this cartoon, because I want you to think about this in terms of a whole bunch of conditions that have to be just right in order for X to balance there very gingerly right on the point of that triangle. All right. So this would be a very improbable pathway, and you're just lucky to get it at all. So this is the view that Dawkins has about the genetic code, for instance. We're just lucky that we got any code at all when you look at all the antecedent conditions that had to be satisfied for this to happen. But we can change the number, right? We can change the value that we assign to that origination probability. Oh, before we go on, another way to think about this is a lottery cylinder. So here I've got a bunch of wooden balls in my cylinder, maybe 40 of them separately numbered, and I crank that cylinder around, I, I introduce a randomizing step that we cannot follow. So this is effectively going to be a random draw. There's no way to follow those balls. There's no way to predict what's going to happen. We're just going to sample from that cylinder and come up with some string of numbers, and the probability of, of that particular string will be exceedingly small. So that's another good model for uh, an improbable causal pathway. But, well, before we go on, what happens in a case like this is when we're evaluating our independent origins versus common ancestry is we take this probability and we tra transfer it over here. And because these are independent pathways, these are independent events, these probabilities will multiply by each other meaning that this scenario is always going to lose to this one if these probabilities are small, all right? But uh, the product rule in probability theory applies. This scenario is going to lose every time, independent origins. But, well, here's, an, here's a, using the lottery cylinder metaphor. Here's another way to think about it. We've got our 40 balls. We crank them around. That's an independent event. We multiply that probability via a second independent event where the same process is operating. That's going to give us the joint probability for the scenario overall. And this formalizes our intuition that the Mona Lisa could not have been painted twice, right? Now, watch what happens. Well, here's just a cartoon why that loses. When we take this out of lottery cylinders and paintings and go back into biology, for most evolutionary biologists, the hypothesis that you could have had a second origin of life uh, 
where you end up with the genetic code that we have, uh, with the molecular characters, players that we have, such as the ribosome and so forth, they're grateful, in a sense, that that happened at all, right? And then you postulate, well, there was a separate second origin of life, independent of the first, where you ended up with the same hardware. They say, forget it, right? It, the product rule is going to hold. It's just hopelessly improbable. So Christian Schwabe in the early 90s, he said, no thought must be wasted on such a proposal, right? Forget about it. We're lucky to be here. Okay, now watch what happens, though, when we change the probabilities away from zero or near zero, effectively. In fact, right here in my drawer, <laughs> I have my handy little prop. I don't know. Can you see that? It's a red bead on a copper wire. So here's my probability interview, interval. My left hand is zero. My right hand is one. Left hand, it's not going to happen at all. Right hand, it's bound to happen. So the origin of life as an event is somewhere in that interval. And for, for Ernst Mayer and Richard Dawkins and many other evolutionary biologists, Jacques Minot, for instance, the bead is really almost indistinguishable from zero. It's way over here on the left. We're just lucky to be here at all. As Jacques Minot put it, we won in the cosmic roulette game, the Monte Carlo game. Well, Christian de Duve or Stuart Kaufman, also working on the origin of life, they say the red bead is actually over here, right? Effectively one, and we just need to figure out the actual pathway. So if we change our pathways here, and my metaphor for this is a funnel. You pour in some sand, right? And the, the structure of the funnel is going to put all the sand out in one spot deterministically. So instead of a lottery cylinder, now think of a funnel. All the sand goes in. It comes out at the same location. We change the probabilities to de a deterministic or quasi-deterministic value close to one. Now these scenarios are indistinguishable because one times one is one. The product rule will still apply there for independent origins, but there's no advantage to invoking a single original pathway if you're going to get the same object no matter what. And this is especially important when you come to something like the origin of the ribosome. These transition probabilities now become very critical for reasons we'll go into later. All right, so let's keep going. This is why we don't infer in ur quartz. Given the right conditions, quartz happens. It occurs independently. Um, I'm looking at the time, Jeff, and I'm definitely going to run over. Is that okay? Uh, that's okay. I think I have till uh, I have another hour. Uh, All right. But and you know what you can do also? I don't mean to give you advice about how to edit your material. You may just want to cut this into two because I still have a long way to go. Okay. Well, you know what? We can uh, we can cut it here if you want. Or what, just let me know when you think it's a natural, uh, uh, the best uh, place to cut. And I'll, Well, you know um, what? what? Why don't we do this? I will just press on. Okay. And. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not judge how long it would take. I'm having too many digressions. No, just, that's fine. All right, I'm just going to press on, and we can we can sort sort it out later. All right. So this is why <laughs> we fair enough. We this is why we don't infer in ur quartz. It would be nonsense to do that because these these probabilities are deterministic. Okay. Now we come to the origin of life, and the assumptions that one makes about those original pathways become critical to how you infer common ancestry or not. In other words, the point I made earlier about the origin of life and the structure of the tree of life interfingering, they really do interfinger intimately in a way that what you assume about one is going to affect how you make inferences about the other. All right. So again, here's our object teetering on the point of that improbable triangle. 
Here, common ancestry is going to win because we this particular pathway, we're just lucky to have it, all right? Now here again, raise these probabilities and there's nothing that favors common ancestry, at least on the basis of just this evidence. What this means is that reconstructing Darwin's tree of life, that is starting with existing organisms and working, way, working your way back towards the most plausible account of their history, if you want that geometry to converge at Luca, that's going to require either a very improbable origin of life or some bottleneck or singularity after the origin such as the fixation of the genetic code. It, fa it falls right out of the mathematics and logic of the inference. Uh, so here, and I realize, <coughs> excuse me, real organisms are more interesting than colored squares in PowerPoint. Uh, but this is just a cartoon representation of, of Darwin's tree of life, right? Where, where every, every living thing on the planet is somewhere within that tree. This geometry, where you're funneling back to Luca, requires either an improbable origin of life, right? That that, if that pathway right here going up to the first cell was very unlikely, or there was some small probability bottleneck, like the fixation of the genetic code after the origin of life, but prior to Luca, that where you end up with a single last universal common ancestor. Change those probabilities, either eliminate the singularity or say the origin of life as Kaufman and Deduve and other uh, researchers say is you know, bound to be close to one. Change those probabilities and this geometry comes apart from the bottom. So I, I showed this slide yesterday. Dawkins says, how do I know? That, that universal common descent is true. Well, the genetic code, right? It's universal. I, I, you know, it's actually not the case, but when he wrote this, the, the, the variants were only just beginning to be discovered so we can forgive him for this claim. Uh, I wouldn't forgive him today for it, but at the time Blind Watchmaker was written, uh, the genetic code more or less did appear to be universal. He said the odds of the same dictionary of arbitrary meanings arising twice are almost unimaginably small. Well, that's almost right. In order for Dawkins to be right, the origin of the code even once must have been exceedingly improbable. All right. So he needs this to be the case because if you change these numbers and you say, well, the code is actually going to fall out of an unknown deterministic pathway, you're bound to get it once the right conditions are present. Now the existence of the code is no longer a marker of history in the sense of pointing to a unique event, right? And it, it, again, it relates to these causal pathways and what their probabilities are. As the probability of any a pathway approaches one, nothing favors common ancestry. So to root the tree of life, Darwin's single tree. The origin of life needs to look like is what Israeli philosopher of science Iris Fry calls a near miracle. And this has implications for the naturalistic project of explaining life on Earth and its diversity. So to spell out those implications, an old joke. And I apologize. I shouldn't tell the audience that I think the joke is actually not that funny, but it's actually not that funny. Yeah, I'm Presbyterian. We'll go with this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so a rabbi, a priest, and a Presbyterian minister are out fishing one day, and uh, a mile from shore, they run out of beer. So the priest says, no problem. I'll get it. Gets out of the boat, walks across the water to the car parked on the shore, gets the beer, gets the six-pack, comes back to the boat. Now, the rabbi is unfazed, right? He's happily fishing away. The Presbyterian is stunned, although he's not going to say anything because he doesn't want to appear naive or, or surprised, but he's like, what just happened? The priest, the Roman Catholic priest, priest walked across the water and came back. Ah, what's going on? All right, so they keep fishing. They run out of sandwiches. Now, the rabbi says, my turn. I'll, I've got this. He gets out, walks across the water comes back with the sandwiches. Now, 
the priest is fishing as if nothing unusual has happened, but the minister is beside himself. He can't believe it. All right, this is this is amazing. Then they run out of bait. So the minister is not going to let the Protestant world down. So he says, it's my turn, right? Steps out of the boat, sinks between the waves, never to be seen again. And the priest says to the rabbi, oh, Bob didn't know where the rocks were. It's how sad. All right, I told you it wasn't funny. But it is illustrative. What's going on? There is a deterministic pathway if only you know where it is. It's not a miracle. There are rocks just below the surface that the, that the priest and the rabbi knew about. It wasn't a miracle at all. The rocks were there. Unfortunately, Pastor Bob didn't know where they are. Now, what's the relevance of this rather lame joke to the problem of the origin of life? The whole thrust of abiogenesis research is to make the origin of life, starting with chemistry, as probable as it can be. They're trying to raise those probabilities towards one. That's what, that's what people who work on the chemistry of RNA, for instance, are trying to do. They want in a single pot reaction to be able to get that complex biomolecule from its constituents under conditions that are not miraculous or near miraculous. In other words, they're looking for the rocks between the waves. Why? Well, if nothing else, there's no point in doing experiments on the origin of life on what are effectively near miracles. So moving bottom, bottom up from chemistry towards the cell, origin of life researchers are trying to raise the probabilities as close to one as possible. Meanwhile, working top down from living things and inferring Happen again. Is, yeah, nature is providing us with. Oh, maybe there is a 40 minute. Uh, no, we're still recording. You just keep going. All right. There's a 40 minute limit somewhere. All right. Somewhere it is in. There. All right, keep going. We were just on the, the, the joke. And okay. A little so, bit after the joke. Okay. Go yeah. On. All right. Okay. So here we are. All right. So you've got a a inferential structure coming top down from living things going back towards the origin of life that's chaining together improbabilities such as the first origin of the genetic code so these two frameworks of inference are actually using probability in very different ways bottom up trying to get the numbers as high as possible top down using using singularities to bring together the branches of the tree of life. Sorry. All right. So this is this is cartoon just shows you what I uh, was waving my hands about. The main goal of naturalistic origin of life chemistry is to get these numbers here on the bottom, right? To get them as close to one as possible. So. These two programs within the overall naturalistic project are fundamentally at odds with each other. Now, when you take this insight and you go out into the biological literature, you'll find that inferences to singularities, unique events are everywhere, right? From the first origin of life up to the origin of the major domains, to the origin of eukaryotes, the origin of animals, and so forth. And they're diagnosed by a claim like this, the origin of character X, maybe it's the genetic code, maybe it's the vertebrate body plan, occurred only once, such that all X observed today must trace its history to these singularities. So William Martin in Dusseldorf, who works on the origin of the eukaryotes, he said that event when an alpha proteobacterium was engulfed by some Archean a single-celled ancestor and set up shop, that alpha proteobacteria set up shop as a mitochondria, that happened once in 4 billion years at the same rate at which life in the solar system arose. All right, well, ask yourself, how does he know, right? That's a very, very small frequency. What's the basis evidentially of that claim? 
once in four billion years. But that kind of claim is present right throughout the evolutionary literature as you're working your way top down based on the biology that we see today and putting the tree of life together. You're using these singularities to chain these various lineages together. How does he know? Okay. Elliot Sober at Wisconsin has worked on this problem for a long time. Uh, and uh, his books and papers uh, uh, represent a variety of different attacks on this problem, uh, kind of disarticulating the logic, taking apart the pieces of the logic of these inferences. And uh, that's why I've given the name Sober's Paradox to what I'm going to describe, because really he's done the real spade work to try to understand this, this mode of reasoning. So he uses a comparative likelihood framework. Uh, the law of likelihood here in this formulation from Ian Hacking in 1965, don't let this formula be daunting. Really what it's saying here is we have two incompatible hypotheses, H1 and H2, with associated probabilities. And we want to ask which is stronger Conditional, the vertical bar here is the, the sign for conditional, on the evidence. And H1 will be stronger than H2. That ratio between these two hypotheses will be stronger if and only if the evidence conditional on now on the hypothesis is stronger for H1 than it is for H2. So that's a lot of abstraction. Here's a, here's a kind of practical example. Let's say H1 was, some person was infected by a SARS-CoV-2 carrier. They've got COVID and you want to know how did that happen? So they've got the disease, the illness, and you say, well, you've got two hypotheses. Either they were infected, H1, infected by somebody else with the virus, or H2, independently of everybody else on the planet and all the other examples that we have of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, somehow the virus evolved independently in the history of that person. And that's why they have COVID. They were not infected. There was a separate independent pathway to that virus. Well, here I've set this up in such a way that evidence is strongly going to favor H1. And uh, Sober unpacks this by saying our probab probabilistic intuitions tell us reduce appeals to luck. Coincidence. Keep your luck, <laughs> keep your appeals to luck, coincidence, as low as possible. Why? Because that's rational. Okay. So <clears throat> here's how he put it in his 1988 book. Uh, uh, dealing with phylogenetic inference or reconstructing the history of life. Uh, he says, you've got an observed similarity between two events. And you can postulate two separate and independent causes, but this explanation would make the correlation too improbable. A common cause, in this case, now it's going to be common ancestry, is preferable because it makes the observations less of a miracle. It is more probable because it strains our credulity less. The operative, the operative idea here is likelihood, that formula that I showed you on the previous slide. And again, this fits with our probabilistic intuitions of, as we've been uh, unpacking them so far, right? The line from Jefferson, the Mona Lisa, and so forth. We want to keep our luck down our appeals to luck down, we want the most probable or plausible explanation for the observations. But, a big red but, okay? When we come to Bob, back into biology, leaving aside Jefferson, leaving aside the Mona Lisa, we come back into biology, difficulties arise when we interrogate our intuitions in biology against different possible backgrounds. So uh, another thought experiment would be helpful here. Here's Alice. She is a molecular geneticist and looking at a, her model species and she sequences a gene 
that looks like that. All right. There's the sequence, five prime to three prime. Now, Alice, let's call it gene A for Alice. Alice is working independently of Bob. Bob's another molecular geneticist using a different species, a different model system, but he's also looking at its DNA, and he sequences a gene from species B, uh, or let's call it gene B for Bob, and they have no knowledge of each other at this point. So they're, they're working away independently. And they independently form hypotheses about the origins of A and B. All right. So they're not just doing the, the genetics. They actually want to do the evolutionary theory about the origin of these genes. So Alice, there's Alice's gene A. There's Bob's gene B. Alice says, A arose via an improbable pathway that occurred once in 4 billion years. So let's just borrow that frequency from William Martin, right? Once in 4 billion years, we're just lucky to have A within that interval of time. A arose once via this very improbable pathway from starting point X. Okay, keep that in mind. This is going to be a spatio-temporally distinct theater from the, the scenario that Bob is going to come up with. Now, Bob, again, working independently, he says, you know what? I have starting point Y. He doesn't know about Alice, but he formulates his hypothesis. He says, I've got starting point Y, and I also have a one in four billion year frequency for this, this event, okay? And X and Y, the starting points are spatio-temporally distinct. These are different stories about how A and B came to exist in the biosphere. Now. We introduce Alice and Bob. They know about each other. They know about each other's genes. All right. It turns out that the genes and their products are functionally related. In other words, they both code for catalytic RNAs, which seem to be doing the same job in the cell. And now that, now that Alice and Bob know about each other's hypotheses, which are not congruent, right? They're different causal stories. They need to sort out who's right, all right? So the first thing they do is they align their sequences. And when they do, using a standard alignment software, they find regions of identity, right? So these bases are identical when we compare A and B. Now, there's an associated probability with this sequence, right? The fact of identity is very significant. You can't ignore it, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's data calling for a causal explanation. So they align their sequences. They find that they're identical. And it turns out that these regions correspond, these regions of identity correspond to secondary structure motifs and self-cleaving RNAs. So the, 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 the causal story is related to a functional role for the RNA product of these DNA sequences, right? So they're putting their, they're putting their hypotheses together, they're sifting them, and they're saying, well, they look like the, these two genes are doing the same thing, yet we still have two different hypotheses about the, how they came to be. Let's call in our colleague Dave. There he is. And he's going to adjudicate. We'll ask him to sort out, is, is hypothesis A the case or hypothesis B? Because they can't both be the case. That's the intuition anyway that Alice and Bob have. So we ask Dave to apply widely accepted principles from molecular evolutionary theory, like this one from Patterson. So Dave is our hypothesis referee. And we say, Dave, this is textbook theory. Apply this principle that convergence between molecular sequences cannot occur and give us a definitive ruling. Is Alice right? Is Bob right? So uh, Dave looks at this, right? This is, the, this is the conflict to be resolved theoretically. And he says, well, let's see. And he says, we're going to compare the two and we'll assign them truth values. 
So let's say Alice is true. Well, if I apply that principle, the molecular convergence can't occur. In other words, you can't have two separate origins for something that exhibits this high degree of similarity. Bob's got to be wrong, right? Because that one in four billion frequency, it it's not going to happen again. Bob's got to be wrong. Or, says Dave, right? So that outcome is possible. Maybe Alice is right. Bob's got to be wrong. Or perhaps Bob is right and Alice has got to be wrong. That's possible. Or maybe they're both wrong, right? And some third hypothesis is the correct one. So Dave says, what you've given me leads to this. One of you can be right. The other could be right. You could both be wrong, but this can't happen. You can't both be right. That is not possible. Applying the, these core principles of molecular phylogenetic inference, you can't both be right. All right. Now, what I've laid out here undergirds molecular phylogenetic inference in 2022. It is widely held by people who do this kind of work that this cannot happen. Okay. You can't have independent causal pathways leading to high degrees of molecular similarity. It's just implausible, and it's ruled out. Now, what's the twist in my little thought experiment here? The twist is, well, I'm going to skip this. Dave says the thought experiment is silly. Let me just skip that. The twist is sequences A and B are not fictional. They were evolved in Boston <coughs> and published in Nature in the lab of Jack Shostak uh, at the uh, Mass General. All right. So they're not made up. These are actual sequences. Here they are. Here are the regions of universal conservation. Now, each of these rows is a separate sequence, RNA, a DNA sequence coding for a catalytic RNA. The columns show in the alignment where there are universally conserved bases, okay? And these, these correspond to structural elements in this, in this catalytic RNA. So this is actual data. These sequences were evolved, quote unquote, in separate populations in the lab of Jack Shostak. And they are uh, features of what's known as the hammerhead ribozyme. So you can see this looks like the head of a ball peen hammer. This is a self cleaving RNA and it's functional. It's found ubiquitously throughout life. Now, what prompted Shostak and his group to do these experiments? What prompted them, let's go back here to this slide, was they found the hammerhead, excuse me, they found the hammerhead in all across the tree of life, in plant viruses, in the genomes of newts, in schistosomes, in cave crickets. That is not a coherent phylogenetic grouping, right? The hammerhead is, is occurring on the tree of life like Christmas tree ornaments on a pine tree. They're distributed every, these, these uh, self-cleaving RNAs are distributed everywhere. So they said, maybe evolution has done this repeatedly, right? It's invented the hammerhead structure multiple times independently on different parts of the tree of life because nature is looking for the simplest solution to a functional problem. It's evolution in this sense is being channeled to come up with the same sequence or sequences with a very high degree of similarity to give this particular two-dimensional uh, or secondary structure. And Dave got it wrong. <coughs> Where did he go wrong? Well, he went wrong here. He got these origination probabilities wrong. Now, what you need to bear in mind is this is what we see in the red box, right? We're comparing sequences. The rest of this down here 
is inference. So this is what we actually observe, and we are inferring this, meaning that inferences to common ancestry are always conditional on what you assume about the origination probabilities. The gray rectangle is all inference. Observation is limited to the comparisons that we make based on our, our current sample. And one of my PhD advisors, Lee Van Valen, uh, put it very beautifully in a, in a uh, publication in 1983. He said, homology is always an inference, never an observation. What we observe is similarity, similarity or identity, never homology. Now, what's the, what is the take-home moral from that statement? Observe similarity, even identity, as we see in this case with these RNA sequences or these, these DNA sequences coding for a catalytic RNA. Even identity does not tell us which causal process is responsible. So Professor Dave got it wrong because this is the ca causal model, the probabilistic model that he has in mind, the lottery cylinder. And he's assuming that the origin of that gene was an exceedingly small probability Markov chain. Okay, but this is also possible. My, my visual metaphor here of the funnel where you have a deterministic pathway. In fact, Chostak and his group said in their paper, we, they said, it may be the case that evolution is constrained by chemistry to give you the same macromolecular structures repeatedly. In other words, there's very strong selection for the same outcome, and that, that outcome will occur in independent conditions with a probability approaching one. So the observation of similarity does not automatically yield an inference to homology or, or common ancestry. You've got to investigate this. What is the causal process responsible? Okay, so Dave got it wrong because he assumed small probability, origination probabilities when they were effectively one. Now, Sober, in his 2008 book, he, he addresses this and he says, how do we come to inferences of common ancestry anyway? Well, we've got some ancestor <clears throat> that has a trait T. and or we infer an ancestor with trait T, and we observe X and Y have T, we infer common ancestry for X and Y if the probability of the origin of T in the common ancestor is improbable. The more improbable it is, the stronger the evidence that X and Y had common ancestry. So improbable here, this adjective refers again to the causal chain, the pathway that leads to the origin of T. And this rests entirely on what we know about the evolutionary processes at work. So he, Sober, in this 2008 monograph, is tuned in to the inferential structure that leads you from observation back to the inference of common ancestry. And he says that inference to common ancestry is well-grounded if the origin of the original trait was sufficiently improbable. So what he's addressing is, again, back at, with my cartoon here, forget about matching. Matching is not where the action is inferentially. The action is here with the origination probabilities. So, t so Sober is saying, if you have a high origination improbability, this scenario is going to win over this one. Change this, however, and independent origins becomes more plausible. So again, using my model here of a lottery cylinder, change that to a funnel, and common ancestry is not going to be more likely. All right? The product rule applies in the case of a high origination in probability. This independent origin scenario will lose because... We don't want to appeal to luck, right? Practical reason depends on this. When we go back into biology, however, and analyze hypotheses of common ancestry, if we change our probabilistic model from lottery cylinder to funnel, go from improbable to deterministic, 
the entailment of or, or the effect of Sober's paradox is, well, it's counterintuitive. Let's put it that way. Here's one consequence. All right. What Sober says here has consequences for how we infer history. In particular, entailment one is the less you know about the origin of a trait, the more confident you can be that it was present in a common ancestor. So in the case of the genetic code, we can see, we can see this clearly. All right, Francis Crick was well aware of this. So in his famous 1968 paper on the origin of the genetic code, he said, well, it's a frozen accident. What does he mean? Well, an accident in that sense is a chain of irreproducible events that end up as being a one-off, probabilistically identical to a randomized draw from a lottery cylinder, all right? Crick didn't like this. When you read his 68 paper, he says, you know, I'm calling it a frozen accident, but frankly, I'm not happy with that. Why? Well, you go and look at the paper, and he said, in the end, he comes to the end of the paper, he says, my frozen accident theory seems plausible, but as a theory, it has a major defect. It is too accommodating. In a loose sort of way, it can explain anything. Second disadvantage is the early steps needed to get the system going seem to require rather a lot of chance effect. All right. The lottery cylinder model, right, where... where the event happening at all looks extremely improbable. And events that have that character, if I can use my little prop here again, right? So let's say our red ball is the event origin of the genetic code. If I slide it over here close to zero, what rational grounds do I have for thinking it happened at all? Events that are one off like that are right on the edge of not happening at all, where the probability effectively goes to zero. Okay, so Crick is bothered by this because it doesn't look robust as an inference, which brings us to the second entailment. I'm going to skip that slide to stay on track. Uh, a German biologist, Johann Wegley, who works on these problems of phylogenetic inference, he said, there's a problem when we have these events that are effectively poised right next to zero. The question is, why should we think they happened at all? So he's looking at, you know, these, these comparative inferences. And he says, well, you know, we have the intuition that, a multi that multiple evolution of identical complex structures is low, that that probability is low. The problem is it gets so low that it, it seems to entail that it should not happen at all. And again, right, you've got my, we've got my interval here, complexity, lucky to get it once, why should you think it happened at all? And biology seems, comparative biology seems to rest on a very fragile probabilistic basis. All right, so this is my last slide and I've run over by, looks like about 35 minutes, I apologize for that. But this is an actual slide from the biologist Jonathan Eisen at UC Davis from one of his undergraduate biology lectures. And the question he's asking in this slide is, how do we know that all living things share a common ancestor? And he says, well, they all have a ribosome. And the argument that this diagram represents is easy or should be easy to understand on the basis of what I've just said. So he's, I'm sorry, he's looking at different groups here that all possess, this is a little cartoon representation here of a ribosome. He says, I find a ribosome in these different groups and I work my way backwards and I say, could that have happened more than once? No way, right? So this is his actual slide. Right, a screen capture of his actual slide. He says there's no way that the character uses a ribosome for translation could have evolved in separate origins of life, meaning that this pathway here, right, from the prebiotic milieu, somehow the ribosome gets up and running. This pathway, the probability of this pathway is basically indistinguishable from zero. That's how you can chain these different groups together because you say, look, 
We're lucky to have it at all. So when we find it in different groups that are otherwise, you know, have lots of distinguishing characters, they all share a ribosome. That tells us they all share a common ancestor. Why? Because the pathway to the first origin of the ribosome is, is effectively indistinguishable from zero. What you should now be able to see is the fragility of this inference. Because let's jump 100 years into the future, or 50 years into the future, when very clever biochemists have figured out a deterministic pathway, or quasi-deterministic, very high probability pathway, for the origin of something that looks like the ribosome. In other words, we're going to change the probability of this pathway from zero, and we're going to slide it over, my bead on a wire, we're going to slide it over towards one. What happens when we do that is our no way turns into, well, yeah, it's going to happen. And this inference comes apart from the bottom. All right. Evolutionary theory today in 2022, the, the, the logical structure of its inferences is very fragile because they rest on a chain of singularities. Singularities, I would say what, what, what you do when you infer a singularity is you say, I don't actually know how that happened, right? Right now, there's, there are a variety of different hypotheses for the origin of the ribosome. What's not available are demonstrated experimentally demonstrated transition probabilities for how the different ribosomes present in different domains could have arisen from a common ancestor. They have a lot of differences that are not shared. The protein complement of an archaeal ribosome is not the same as that of a bacterial ribosome. This slide represents an argument that is exceedingly fragile, and I'm going to leave it there, but I hope this rant of an hour and a half has alerted you to some puzzles and problems in the inferential structure of evolutionary theory. And the book that I'm working on, <coughs> excuse me, and some papers will spell this out in, in, in less ranty, more coherent, I hope, detail. But I hope I've alerted you to some puzzles. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. You can. Uh, I'm not sure where our, our little faces went, but uh, you can stop sharing the screen if, uh, and we can just uh, talk. I guess a few questions. So, uh, in terms of maybe from an intelligent design perspective, oh, there you are. Um, what would you say in terms of so the probability goes to the stuff about the origin probabilities? Uh, do you have? From our from our intelligent design perspective, would that be something akin to like um, you have two Fords and you have a Ford factory? So the Ford factory, ha you have two origins for seeing this in, in say two different models or something. And with that, um, so uh, intelligence would basically, as it plays out in history, puts it to uh, the probability to one is—is is that how you would argue it, or was, uh... no? I guess with intelligent design, I think you're going to come at these problems entirely differently. So this is from a non-intelligent design perspective. This is all. This is all within a naturalistic framework. All within a naturalistic framework. Yeah. Okay. So so uh, I in preparing this talk, which which again ran over my time limit. I eliminated, I eliminated a lot of slides which set this whole question in the context of intelligent design versus a naturalistic scenario. I mean, if you want to set up something else in the future to go over that, that would be uh, fine with me. If not, that's... Uh, oh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, maybe we can do that sometime and we can set something up. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah I can, with, the, with the understanding that people have watched the previous ones. Yeah. Um, uh, so is Can there I, a, may I address your question though? Yeah, yeah. Uh, from a design framework, I would come at it with the question: What possible causes does similarity have? Okay, so I would open up 
the range of possible causes to more than physics and chemistry, uh, in other words, to more than bottom-up deterministic pathways. So uh, I ask you, let's say I give you a sheet of paper like this, right? And I say, Jeff, sign your name for me five times, right? Yeah. And I don't tell you why. And you just, you know, give me five signatures. And I hand this to someone who didn't know what we just did, right? So I go into another room. There's somebody sitting there. And I say, what's the best explanation for this pattern of similarity, your the five signatures? And they say, well, some guy named Jeff Robinson signed his name, right? An agent. You are a complex nonlinear system that outputs a very regular pattern that the government and banks and you know lawyers mm -hmm. used to identify you. The similarity that's there does not have a common ancestral template. Its cause is a particular agent. So if you open up the range of possible causes for the observation similarity, deterministic templating from a common material source is not the only reasonable possibility. Or consider this. I take a cross section of the wing of a Piper Cub, small single engine fixed mm -hmm. wing aircraft, right? Take a cross section of the wing and I take a cross section of the wing of an Airbus three, what is it? The, the, the big, the big Airbus. Yeah, it's not, I've read right? our 380 something. Or yeah, something. the big guy. Mm -hmm. And it looks like this. Airfoil. Why an airfoil? Because in an atmosphere like we have on Earth, if you want to fly, you need lift. You need something with this shape. And there are lots of different theories about how lift works. But the airfoil shape gives you lift, right, on a planet with, with our characteristics. The similarity here is determined by function. Right, so the presence of an airfoil shape in a whole variety of different flying craft is a consequence of a functional requirement. So that that uh, self cleaving catalytic RNA, the hammerhead ribozyme, may have the similarity that it exhibits, not because there was a common material template, because there doesn't appear to be one. Right, it, it the that feature occurs like. Christmas tree bulbs, right, in an unrelated pattern across the tree of life, that may exist. That similarity may exist for functional reasons. In other words, bottom line, if you expand the range of possible causes for similarity beyond material templating, there may be a variety of different explanations that are perfectly rational and well supported, but you've got to open up, you've got to open up your range of possibilities. I like your metaphor of a Ford factory. <laughs> Where the oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think a lot of this, a lot of, I mean, we've been following the intelligent design stuff maybe since um, someone introduced me to uh, uh, Philip Johnson's book in the mid '90s. But it seems uh, I was a philosophy student at the time, and I, it seems to me a lot of this is, uh, I guess, uh, the way I would phrase it now would be. When all you have is a hammer, all the world looks like a nail, you know? <laughs> you know, if you're a, not to get into weird stuff, but um, I've been doing UFO research and stuff, and I, I actually contacted the people on the Harvard uh, a board who are, or some Harvard group that's going to pull together experts and do this, and I emailed them, and I was going back and forth, and one thing I, I told them was like, look, if you... If you're only going with materialism, you're you're not going to figure this out, right? Because I, I feel there's non-materialism. There's you know non-materialistic answers for UFO phenomena. Uh, not to say there's not material stuff going on, but so the same the same thing is if you limit your options ahead of time, you know you you to only materialism. You're, you're and that, that seems to be the the basically the crux of the intelligent design movement. Well, I think that I think that you're right, and I think that even if I weren't an intelligent design uh, a proponent, 
I would want the greatest range of possible causes uh, available in the light of the data, in the light of the evidence, mm -hmm. because I want nature to be as surprising as she is, right? I don't want to foreclose any explanatory option. And I admire Lieb, uh, I forgot his first name, Avi. I think it's Avi Lieb, the guy at Harvard, the astronomer at Harvard who's leading this. I, I, I Yeah, that's the one I email. That's the yeah. one I email. Um, I'll have to get I, in touch with you uh, later about that. Yeah, I admire his uh, his courage in saying to the scientific community, we need to consider a greater range of possible explanations for these puzzling phenomena. I, he, he, he didn't tell me anything. He, he was just like, um, okay, thank you for your email. Take that under consideration. But what, you know, <laughs> in, inferences to agency are not, are not inferences to a, you call it materialism. What I would say is it's not an inference to a physics-based explanation. Because mm -hmm. on the way from physics, bottom up, you're building your theory on, you know, the, the, the best knowledge we have in terms of physical systems, and you're climbing up from chemistry, chemistry to biology, on your way up from physics to the agent, when you arrive at an agent, you arrive at causal possibilities that simply have no cognate lower down, right? Why did I decide today to draw an airfoil? There's a perfectly good explanation about my struggle to express a point that has no no parallel down here in the physics. So even though I think Lieb is an atheist, if I'm not mistaken, the the enterprise on which he's embarked is going to require inferences to agents. Yeah. And, and agents uniquely in our experience bring about causal effects, right? That diagnose them. They say, you know, that Stonehenge was built by people, right? Uh, and I don't mean to launch into another rant, but I admire Lieb for doing this because he really is opening up the toolkit of contemporary science to a greater range of possible causes. Yeah, I, I just used that example because I've been knee deep in the paranormal for not to put further uh, aspersions from the atheist community on the uh, uh, in, into the intelligent design world. But well, the, listen, there. There are there are plenty of atheists who are fascinated by. Uh, I, I was just saying I've been knee deep in it, so that's where my first when I'm making connections, yeah. that's where I first go to. I have a couple quick questions because I I do need to get going. Um, so I would assume that in all, all these examples you use, when you're going all those mechanisms, my mind starts going like, well, there must be a bunch of reducibly complex steps along the ways, even if they want to make sort of a tree uh do they have anything besides like just so stories at this point or are they uh... well here's here's the problem with singularities um right now it is biologically impossible to induce a symbiosis uh like we saw like such as is hypothesized that that gave rise to the eukaryotic cell Right. So if you put in the same culture dish uh, an archaean single celled single celled organism without uh, you know laxonucleus and a bacterial cell, they will not form a symbiosis. It just will not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, no known prokaryote can perform phagocytosis. That is they cannot engulf another cell. They, they don't have the machinery. Mm. Being able to engulf another cell, at least in current state of knowledge, is something that only eukaryotes can do. So the very step in the story that needs to happen, the engulfment, we have no, we have no examples of it, right? So what happens? So you say, once upon a time, a couple of billion years ago, this happened. We don't know how, we don't know the pathway, and it happened once. Okay, now you, 
it's a pejorative to call that a just so story, but what it is, if, I'm, not, I'm not imputing that to you, but that's what it effectively is, is saying something happened, we don't know how, and we don't know having any examples of it happening with the organisms that we actually see. But to tell, to give a, an account for how eukaryotes came to be, we need to infer that this occurred. But we can only sort of write a check on the account of luck using a different metaphor, we can write a check on the account of luck once for that event, and then we, mm-hmm. close that, we close that account. I do not regard that as scientifically satisfying, right? Yeah. It may be adequate for other people. I do not regard that as scientifically satisfying because it, it, effectively uh, what I'm saying is I won the lottery and I'm just happy that I won the lottery, but don't ask me how. Okay, but that that mode of reasoning isn't just for endosymbiosis. You see it for the origin of of body plans. You see it for the origin of the genetic code. You see it for the origin of complex structures and complex characters. It is a besetting sin of. It's evolution. all over the place, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's a besetting sin of evolutionary theory to avail itself of these kinds of singularities. And frankly, I think they get away with it because they don't have any competition. All right. So uh, my last question, and then maybe if we we take a week or two break, maybe we can um, allow for people to have questions. You know, so our next session will be how would you adjudicate between uh, intelligent design and the other options? Um, I guess when, uh, do you have a title for your book and, uh, do you have a plan on how, how long it would, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it will be out next year. Mm -hmm. And the working title is on O N common descent on common descent. Three words. Oh, uh, you need something more exciting. (laughs) Like the the tree of life and splinters or something like that. That's the working title. Working titles don't have to be exciting. They just have to be a name that I can give. To we, we, we sell this, uh, you know. And you know you know who determines titles? Who? Not authors. Publishers. Uh, Darwin's Black Box was the, the free press when that, when Mike Behe's book came out in 90, I think it was 96. Six, I, yeah. Oh, man, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Getting I bet old. you're not as old as me. No, but I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> um, but, all right. Uh, no, you were going to say what was his original title? or? Oh, I think that title was actually, if I'm not mistaken, was actually his editor at the Free Press came up with that. Uh, well, he uh, wrong, and my apologies to Mike if, that's, if that was his baby, but good titles are hard to find. I... Mm-hmm. I was advising Steve Meyer for months before he came up with Signature in the Cell. He ran through a whole bunch of different titles. So I agree, it's boring. Uncommon Descent is boring, but that's my working title. Unless it's a textbook. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got to, let me, uh, uh, okay, so we'll have you back. And people, please leave for the questions and yeah, we'll tra- I'd, lo- we'll I'd love to, to do another. I'd love to do another session. And then maybe. I'll, um, our... I just, our Ty, Our first video was just posted fine. while we were interview while we were recording. So I'm not sure exactly when this one will go up. I might have to do some editing and stuff like that. All right. All right. Let me stop recording and then we'll see you later. Lord willing. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>